walang natira ni Jesus. Pag may natirang mitigating circumstance din. So, ganun lang kas kadali yung object niyo. No? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag-view object mo muna. Pag may natirang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natirang medium period, pag may natirang mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, ganun lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinisider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one. You have to be guided by Section 1 of Rule 138 because Rule 138 is one of the sources of legal ethics. Who may practice law? Ang sinasabi dyan ay any person heretofore duly admitted as a member of the bar or hereafter admitted as such in accordance with the provisions of this rule and who is in good and regular standing is entitled to practice law. Iyan po iyon. That is ULEP versus Legal Aid Clinic. ULEP versus Legal Aid Clinic. Okay? Yan yung doktrina. Alin yun, sir? Eh, yung any person. Kasi any person may mean na pwede palang mag-practice kung hindi yan natin makokorek, pwede palang mag-practice ang juridical person. So, let us disabuse... shares of XYZ, the 40% shares of XYZ, likewise owned by the same foreign corporation owned by foreigners that directly owns 40% of uh, ABC corporation. So to repeat, let's say the foreigners, right? The foreign held corporation owns 40,000 of 100,000. The same time, the foreign held corporation owns 40% of XYZ share in ABC Corporation. So the question now is, based on these figures, is ABC a Philippine national? Is it qualified to invest in public utility? Is it compliant with the Constitution? You have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply, under the general under the new rules no if you fail to file a reply okay lang kasi exceptional situation lang ang rule na ngayon all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already so maski walang reply all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already if you talk
in relation to days in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20,000, the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely. There is no question he because he would accept. Okay? Uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third... Uh, Together we can. Walang natira din yung video. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance din. So, ganun lang kas kadali yung object din. No? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung consider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstance. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one.
to our dear attendees from different parts of the country. I pray that you're all in a great state of health. This free webinar is streaming live via the Villales Law Center's YouTube channel and Facebook page. If you can hear my voice clearly, please type in the comment section hashtag VLC. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Optimize this learning opportunity. Share this free online lecture to your friends and together learn at the comfort of your homes. I want to formally welcome you all to this free webinar. This is part of a series of free online lectures brought to you by the virtual law companion of Villages Law Center. Allow me to share to you this good news. The Virtual Law Companion is the newest innovation of Villages Law Center, which aims to provide an easy, convenient, and quality bar review experience. The Virtual Law Companion is a web application that is hosted on a dedicated cloud server. It can be accessed via the internet 24 7 for any web browser using any device or handheld computers like Android or iOS phones. Meaning, you can study anytime, anywhere, and from any mobile device. Please visit our website at www.villagislawcenter.com to know more about our programs and activities. Before we formally start, please take note of some reminders. First, this free webinar is pre-recorded to ensure the uninterrupted streaming of lectures. Secondly, VLC team will be with you to assist you should you need more information about our program. Please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Without further ado, please give your virtual class and welcome our lecturer today. Again, this free webinar is brought to you by our virtual law company. Maraming salamat po. Together, we can make things happen. Together, we can. Uh, good day, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Villasis Law Center. Uh, I am uh, Prosecutor, uh, Assistant Special Prosecutor Ryan Kilala uh, from the Office of the Ombudsman. And this afternoon, I will be discussing uh, rules of procedure in the Office of the Ombudsman uh, with regard to uh, criminal and administrative cases filed before the said office. Okay. So, um, with uh, the Villasis Law Center, you can uh, prepare for uh, the bar exam this year uh, anytime, anywhere. Use any of your gadgets, uh, electronic gadgets, and you just uh, log on to the website of uh, the Villasis Law Center. It is uh, www.villasislawcenter.com. And uh, incidentally, uh, we would like to request you to um, like, uh, you uh, follow, and subscribe to the Facebook accounts, uh, Facebook account and the YouTube account of uh, Villasis Law Center. So if everything is uh, okay on your end, if you can hear me clearly, just type uh, VCL on uh, the uh, chat box, in the chat box. Okay, you can also type Ryan Parasabayan if you are a friend of mine in uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram also in TikTok, also in YouTube. I have a YouTube uh, channel also. Okay, so let us start. So for, for the this lecture, um, I will be conducting a one-hour lecture on the rules of procedure on uh, cases filed before the Office of the Ombudsman. And 
uh, to give you an overview of uh, what you will be um, uh, encountering in this lecture, uh, we will be discussing the uh, disciplinary authority of the office of the ombudsman. Okay, and uh, uh, we all, will also, uh, as a uh, preliminary background, who are the public officials and employees that the ombuds, the office of the ombudsman can investigate. Okay, and also as preliminary, we will also look into the threefold liability of a uh, public official or uh, employee. Okay, so for one act, how many uh, uh, liabilities can a, a public official and employee uh, um, commit? Okay, and then we'll go to the meat of the um, discussion. We go to the grounds uh, in order to file a criminal case against an erring uh, official, public official or employee, uh, uh, criminal for criminal case and uh, administrative case. Okay. And we'll look into the procedure on how the Office of the Ombudsman would proceed on these uh, cases, both, again, criminal and administrative cases. And what would be the remedies if you are an ag aggrieved party and you do not agree with the decision of the Office of the Ombudsman? Uh, what will be your remedies uh, under the rules? Okay. So when I speak of the rules of procedure of the Office of the Ombudsman, I am referring to the uh, administrative order number seven, which was issued way back during the time of Ombudsman uh, Conrado Vasquez, as amended, okay, because uh, of several jurisprudence and um, uh, issuances by the office amending the said rule. Okay, so let us proceed. Uh, what is the mandate of the Office of the Ombudsman? As a background, okay, the Office of the Ombudsman, uh, as protector of the people, we will act on uh, any complaint against erring public official in any form or manner. Meaning, uh, if uh, if you don't want your name to be mentioned, you want an anonymous complaint that uh, the office of the ombudsman will act on that. Okay, in any manner, in any form, like if you can uh, put it in writing, handwritten, or otherwise, you can put it in a piece of paper. You can put it put it in a in an intermediate paper, bond paper, or whatever form. So as long as a complaint is uh, filed before the office of the ombudsman, uh, identifying who the respondent would be, okay, and there are uh, leads and witnesses. So even if it is an an, an uh, anonymous complaint, the office of the ombudsman will will act on it. Okay. Now, as I've said earlier, we will also discuss. What are the disciplinary authority of the Office of the Ombudsman? So as we all know, the Office of the Ombudsman has disciplinary, okay, take note, huh? disciplinary authority over uh, all elective and appointed officials of the government, even members of the cabinet, local government, and the uh, government-owned and controlled corporation. Now, the Office of the Ombudsman cannot discipline okay, uh, officers that can be removed by impeachment the members of Congress and the judiciary. As you know, uh, members of Congress can only discipline its own, the other uh, Congress can only discipline its own members, okay? As well as the members of the bench, uh, wherein uh, the Supreme Court is the only one who can discipline them, okay? And not the Office of the Ombudsman. But when it comes to investigative authority, Okay, the Office of the Ombudsman even has uh, uh, investigative authority over impeachable officers. Okay, but only for the purpose of filing an impeachment complaint. Okay, not to discipline them because as and not to uh, conduct a preliminary investigation uh, on uh, cases filed against them. But be, as we know, be, the uh, Congress shall be the one who will uh, uh, conduct the impeachment trial okay, on this, the, the investigation and trial on uh, these impeachable officers. Okay? But the Office of the Ombudsman can investigate. Okay? Uh, do they have uh, jurisdiction over private individuals? Okay? The answer is yes. Okay? Be if there is a conspiracy 
okay, between uh, the uh, private individual and the public official or employee, uh, then the Office of the Ombudsman has authority to even investigate uh, the uh, private person. Okay, They will be tried jointly and the private uh, person will suffer the same penalty and liability as that of the public officer or employee. Okay, so uh, the, it is clear that uh, even uh, on a, a private uh, person, the Office of the Ombudsman has a capacity to uh, jurisdiction to investigate as long as there is a charge of conspiracy with the public officer or employee. Okay, uh, again, just a background. So you'll see these are the functions of the Office of the Ombudsman. The red one, public assistance, graft prevention. The red, the red ones, investigate. Uh, the, the green one, so uh, our investigation, adjudication, and prosecution. We will concentrate more on the prosecution. Uh, is everything clear? Uh, uh, so if everything's clear, you just uh, uh, type uh, thumbs up in the chat box or you can say uh well the usual the vlc you can type it there so we can see that uh everything is clear now uh the reason why i place red here because if you're requesting for public assistance it does not necessarily mean that you are filing a case against a, a an erring uh, public official or employee but a request for public assistance can ripen into an investigation if so merit Okay, so if a person goes to the office of the, the ombudsman asking for assistance and it turns out that uh, a case should be filed against the uh, public official or employee, then that public assistance can be converted into a complaint and then an investigation may proceed. Okay, so also in graft prevention, uh, aside from conducting uh, uh, fora, seminars, and uh, as uh, a, a, a mean to uh, prevent corruption in the government, then on its own, the, the Office of the Ombudsman can file a case against a public official or employee. Okay, now let's move on. As I've said earlier, we will also slightly discuss the threefold liability of a government uh, official or employee. Okay, so what is this threefold liability? Okay, for one act, or uh, for one offense, okay, a government employee can uh, commit uh, an administrative liability, civil liability, and criminal liability. Okay, so administrative liability is based on the supervisory power of the government. Okay, so the government can either reprimand, uh, impose fine, suspend, or even to the point of removal or dismissal from service. As to civil liability, if there is damage or injury and the individual uh, wants to, to file a claim on such damage or injury, then an order can be issued for the reimbursement uh, or even uh, payment for damages. Okay. As to the criminal aspect, it is based on the right of the state to prosecute uh, this airing uh, public officials or empl employee. Okay, so if the prosecution would eventually be successful, then uh, a, an imprisonment may be uh, 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 given, laid down by the by the court, or a fine, or even both. Okay, and subject also to some accessory penalties like perpetual disqualifications and uh, 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 forfeiture of retirement benefits, among others. Okay. Now, just to give you an example, like if a, uh, in, 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 this, in the screen before you, you'll see that uh, a clerk of court is accused of taking home rims of uh, office-issued bond paper for the use of her children in school. Okay, So the act here is the act of taking rims of uh, office-issued bond paper. This seems uh, normal. Uh, if, in, you, you may have heard of this. Uh, you may know somebody who's uh, committing this. It seems harmless, but the act that uh, you're taking a a, uh, a government property home for the benefit of a, another person or a private person, 
you may be reprimanded or suspended for taking that uh, reams of bond paper home. Now, as to civil liability, a, a fine may be imposed against you for uh, the amount of the reams of bond paper that you brought home. Okay. And as to criminal liability, it may seem harmless, but you have committed the uh, felony of malversation of public property because, uh, as you know, this bond paper were purchased by the government for public use. It belongs to the government. You took it home. Uh, you have uh, converted it uh, uh, for your uh, private benefit. Okay, so uh, you you uh, may have committed the crime of malversation of public property. So being a public official or employee is not that easy because uh, you may think this is harmless, just a piece of paper, uh, just a uh, bond paper, uh, but you may be held liable for uh, three uh, uh, culpabilities, administrative, civil, and criminal. Okay, now let's go to uh, the administrative order number seven on criminal cases. Okay, these are rules of procedure issued by, uh, as I've said, during the time of Ombudsman Conrado Vasquez. Now, what are the grounds? Now, the common notion is that uh, when you talk about the office of the Ombudsman, it is always uh, graft and corruption. Okay, but it's not necessarily uh, just limited to those uh, to, to uh, uh, felonies. Okay, uh, sorry, to, uh, to uh, offenses. Okay. So the first one, if it's a violation of the, of the anti graft and Corrupt Practices Act or Republic Act 319, uh, you can file a criminal case before the Ombudsman. Okay, if it is a violation of the forfeiture law, okay, it is civil in nature, uh, but uh, the office of the Ombudsman has jurisdiction on this. Okay, when you uh, ask for forfeiture uh, of uh, uh, uh the, the the wealth of the uh the airing public official next is violation of the code of uh conduct and ethical standards for public officers and employees okay so you can file a case before the office of the ombudsman next one is on the revised penal code title 7 chapter 2 section 2 what are these if you can recall your uh, criminal law 2 Okay, these are uh, the crimes of bribery, indirect bribery, qualified bribery, bribery, and uh, corruption of public uh, officials. But uh, it's not supposed to uh, stop at Section 2. You can uh, also look into Section 3, 4, 5, I think until 7, uh, until malversation, uh, fraud, and uh, among the other felonies, felonies uh, mentioned in that uh, 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 chapter and the, the sections that I've mentioned. But uh, under uh, the administrative uh, order, number seven, uh, it's titled seven, chapter two, section two. So bribery, indirect bribery, qualified bribery, and uh, corruption of public officials. Okay. The next one is not found in administrative order number seven, but in a succeeding uh, issuances and also uh under the jurisdiction of the uh, Sandigan Bayan, the plunder law has been included. So if you are going to file a case for uh, against a public official for plunder, then uh, the case, case can be filed before the office of the ombudsman. And lastly, those offenses which uh, may be committed uh, by in relation to the office. Okay. Now, what do you mean uh, when you say in relation to office? Okay, we will look into that later. Okay, so uh, you'll see cases in the office of the ombudsman, um, uh, kidnapping, uh, uh, sexual harassment, uh, uh, murder, uh, rob robbery, uh, violation of uh, the uh, of. Uh, uh, presidential decree on uh, obstruction of justice. So we will look into that. It's not mentioned in the in the grounds, but it is included if it is committed in re in relation to office. So here, uh, as I've said, if you look at the Ombudsman Law 6770 and also the Constitution, it does not limit 
the jurisdiction of the ombudsman uh, on uh, pub, uh, corruption and uh, graft and corruption only. So any act or omission which appears to be illegal, unjust, improper, or inefficient. Okay, the office of the ombudsman has uh, primary jurisdiction over uh, cases cognizable by the Sandigan Bayan. Okay, so the office of the ombudsman may take over at any stage from any investigatory agency or uh, other prosecuting arms of the government and continue with the inv investigation thereof. Okay, so as long as the uh, offense is cognizable by the Sandigan Bayan, then it is being investigated by another office. Then uh, as the office with primary jurisdiction, the office of the ombudsman can take over the investigation of such uh, offenses. Okay, so we will also look into the uh, jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan under the new, new law. So you'll also have an idea if the office of the ombudsman can take over the investigation of that particular case. Okay, so when we say in relation to the office, in the case of Montilla versus Hilario, the Supreme Court has already said that relationship between the offense and the office must be direct and not incidental. Okay, the offense cannot exist without the office. So it does not mean that the office or the public office is an essential element of the crime. But as long as the offense has been committed and the office has been used directly, not mere incidental, and if the offense cannot be uh, committed or uh, cannot exist without the, the uh, offender holding that uh, public office, then uh, it is a uh, an offense in relation to their office. Okay? So, which means that if I am a mayor and I gave the orders to to a, 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 a policeman, an illegal order, then uh, that can fall under the jurisdiction of the ombudsman, even if you'll say that uh, uh, it is not uh, among the grounds uh, that we've mentioned, but because the, the policeman would not have followed my order, though illegal, if not for the office that I am holding, and I am, I use that office to uh, uh, for those uh, subordinate officials to commit the offense. Okay, so if we look at the case of Rodriguez versus Hadigan Bayan, just a, a brief background. In uh, if you still remember this case, uh, because of the rampant um, illegal logging in Palawan. So the the PNP and the Department of Environment have conducted uh, uh, confiscations of uh, freshly uh, cut uh, logs in Palawan, but because of uh, the lack of uh, uh, equipment and the truck to bring the uh, the uh, freshly cut logs to uh, their respective offices, it was placed in a uh, in a compound in the municipality of uh, Taytay, Palawan. Okay. So the mayor of the town ordered uh, several uh, punong barangays or, or barangay uh, chairpersons to uh, uh, retrieve those uh, logs that were, were uh, confiscated. So every time a, 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 a punong barangay goes to the uh, compound the officer in charge or the employee in charge of that uh, compound uh, denies their request okay because there's no uh, clearance from the DNR uh, among other uh, offices so until finally uh, the mayor uh, asked another punong barangay with armed together with armed policemen to immediately uh, uh, collect and seize those uh, confiscated uh, logs. Okay, so cases were filed against the mayor. So the mayor said that uh, uh, the case for obstruction of justice cannot be filed against him because uh, the, before the office of the ombudsman because it's not uh, among those that were enumerated. But the Supreme Court said as long as the offense charge and the information is intimately connected with the office and is alleged to have been perpetrated while the accused was in the performance, though improper or irregular, of his official fun function, there being no personal motive to commit the crime, 
and had the accused would not have committed it had he had not held the aforesaid office. Okay, in that particular case, if uh, Rodriguez was not the mayor, the Punong Barangay would not have followed his orders and the, the uh, policeman would not have followed his orders also. So he was, uh, uh, his uh, petition before the Supreme Court was uh, denied. Okay, so uh, he was questioning the uh, uh, resolution by the Sandigan Bayan denying his uh, motion to quash. Okay, so uh, here it, in case it will be asked in the bar exam, you know how to answer if it, the question is on a crime, not within the enumeration, but you can determine if the office was used, okay, and intimately connected to the crime had the, the uh, the perpetrator not been holding that office, the crime would not have been uh, committed or consummated. Okay? That's the case. So let's go into the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan. Okay, as I've said, uh, the, uh, the Sandigan Bayan law as amended because the original uh, law creating the Sandigan Bayan, PD 1606, was amended by uh, Republic Act 8249. So from three divisions, the uh, Sandigan Bayan uh, 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 added two more divisions, making them five. And with the enactment of uh, Republic Act 1060, uh, 1060 okay, uh, uh, from five, it is now seven, the division of the Sandigan Bayan. So as you can see, uh, the enumerations of violations, uh, Republic uh, Act 319 or the Anti-Graph and Corrupt Practice Act, the forfeiture law, the chapter 2, section 2, title 7, book 2 of the revised penal code, among others, including a uh, violation of the uh, code of conduct and ethical standards of uh, uh, public officials and employees and plunder law is included there. Also, uh, felonies, whether simple or complex, they committed in relation to their office. Okay, and uh, the cases uh, cognizable. Uh, under the jurisdiction of the uh, Presidential Commission on Good, Go Good Government, okay, it may be filed be before the office, the so, uh, the court of the Sandigan Bayan. Now that is their original. Now the nuance of this law is that if the information does not charge any damage or or uh, any uh, damage to the government or any bribery. Or if there is an allegation of damage, but the damage does not exceed 1 million pesos, now the jurisdiction will now fall before the office, uh, before the regional trial court. Okay? So before, regardless of the amount, okay, uh, the, the, if it is violation of uh, the, the, the following laws that I mentioned earlier, or, or, or as you can see in your screen, the, the Sandigan Bayan has jurisdiction. But now, uh, if there is no allegation for damage to, uh, to the government or there's no allegation of bribery, or if there is a, an allegation uh, for damages but it does not exceed 1 million pesos, okay, then the, it is the regional trial court who has jurisdiction over such uh, felony. Okay, so just a, an, an overview Okay, on who are the officials covered by uh, the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan. If you can remember, I told you earlier, the Office of the Ombudsman has primary primary jurisdiction over cases cognizable by the Sandigan Bayan, the investigation thereof. So in case it will be asked in the bar exam, so you'll know uh, in a nutshell, as long as the official carries with him a salary grade of 27 and above or above, Okay, uh, then that shall be within the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan. So in the executive branch, salary grade 27 and higher, members of Congress and officials thereof, salary grade 27 and higher, members of the judiciary, okay, it is uh, uh, needless to say uh, the salary grade because uh, their lowest is already uh, salary grade 27. Okay, so chairman and members of the CONCON, uh they have a high salary grade i think they have the salary grade of 30 and 31 respectively uh other national and local officials with salary grade 27 and higher 
So in a nutshell, it's salary grade 27 and higher. Okay, uh, covered by the jurisdiction of the San Biga Bayan. So if an investigation is being conducted uh, on these officials and it's not being conducted by the office of the ombudsman, the ombudsman can take primary jurisdiction and take over the investigation thereof. Okay. Now, when we speak of preliminary investigation in general, as you know, the rule 421, 4, 2 plus 1, 4 plus 2 plus 1, okay, four years, two months, and one day, that is with, with uh, that falls uh, within the uh, coverage of a preliminary investigation. Okay. Lower than that, a uh, directive filing may be held. So, this one, a preliminary investigation is necessary under the rules. Okay. So, under the rules uh, pr uh, procedure of uh, the Office of the Ombudsman, we follow Rule 112, Section 3, Supplementary to as, uh, ad administrative, as Administrative Order Number 7. Okay, so the Office of the Ombudsman also determines probable cause. And what is probable cause? Before you take the bar, you have to take this into heart. You have to memorize this. Okay, whether there is sufficient ground which would in engender a well-founded belief that a crime has been committed and the respondent is probably guilty thereof and he should be held for trial. Okay, uh, my dear friends, you have to memorize this, okay, before you take the bar. It may be useful uh, when it comes to uh, remedial law, okay? If everything's still okay, just put thumbs up, uh, just... Uh, uh, Place comment on the chat box. Chat chat box. Uh, you can mention my uh, my name, Ryan Parasabayan, or whatever. You can also add me in 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 Facebook if you need anything from me. Uh, not not really anything, but you can you, if you know you want to. You need to ask questions regarding the lecture for today, or even uh, in other uh, subjects. Okay, in your screen. Okay, you will see on the left. Okay. These are direct filing complaint. Okay, so it does not uh, undergo preliminary investigation. On your right, okay, if the offender is caught in flagrante delicto, okay, okay, the the fact that the crime has been committed or is being committed or has just been committed in the presence of either a, a uh, law enforcement officer or any private person who will do the uh, what is known as citizen's arrest then the offender may be brought to the nearest police station for uh, custodial investigation and uh, an, uh, an inquest proceeding may uh, proceed uh, thereby questioning the uh, uh, warrantless arrest against the offender and if the uh, warrantless arrest is legal then an information may be filed in court Okay, that is a in flagrante delicto. Okay, so uh, that's uh, on the right on your screen. And in the middle, okay, this is the normal flow of Rule 112 on preliminary investigation. Okay, so an information, I uh, sorry, a complaint may, uh, if, if, if it is, if there is a referral to the barangay, if covered, uh, that it will be referred to the barangay. But, uh, uh, if there is a uh, complaint affidavit, okay, and then the complaint affidavit is filed before the office of the prosecutor, a uh, subpoena will be issued by the uh, investigating prosecutor, uh, giving the uh, respondent a uh, period to file his counter affidavit, okay, and then upon receipt of the counter affidavit, the complainant will be given an op uh time to file uh his or her reply affidavit and then upon receipt of the re reply affidavit the uh, uh respondent will be given an opportunity to file uh his or her uh, rejoinder affidavit and upon receipt of the rejoinder affidavit the uh, complainant uh may have the last say by filing a sue rejoinder affidavit then after all of this uh, exchange of uh, pleadings, affidavits, uh, the uh, investigating prosecutor can now resolve the uh, 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 complaint filed before him. 
Now, if the complaint is not, uh, if the resolution is not fair, favorable to either of the party, they can file a motion for reconsideration. If still not uh, favorable to them, the decision on the motion for reconsideration, they can file a petition for review before the DOJ, and then thereafter, an information may be filed before the uh, regular court. So this, in a nutshell, is the the normal or regular procedure uh, before the office of the prosecutor, okay, under the National Prosecution Services. But what is the difference if it is the rules of procedure or other, uh, administrative order number seven as amended, okay? You get a copy of the amend um, um, uh, uh, the amended copy because you might be uh, using the original one and some of the provisions there are no longer applicable. Okay, so in criminal cases, how will the Office of the Ombudsman act on a complaint filed before it? Okay, so the complaint will be evaluated. If it does not have uh, any merit, then it will be dismissed outright. Okay, uh, if it uh, has uh, merit, then uh, it can be referred to uh, the respondent for comment or uh, even a filing of a counter affidavit. Okay. The 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 initial procedure is that you, the um, respondent may be asked to file a comment on the complaint against him. Now, if the uh, investigating prosecutor finds merit on the case, then he will ask for a counter affidavit. So what's the difference? A comment may may uh, may not be uh, un under oath, but a uh, counter affidavit should be under oath. Okay. So later on, you'll see that if a respondent has already filed a comment but refuses refuses to file a counter affidavit, then the investigating uh, prosecutor of the office of the ombudsman can take that comment and treat it as he, he, the uh, respondent's counter affidavit okay so that's uh uh that's one of the uh, uh difference uh, with uh, the regular preliminary investigation with uh, the office of the prosecutor okay now if the uh, handling uh, prosecutor or handling lawyer in the office of the ombudsman deemed it proper to endorse the case to the proper government agency who has jurisdiction over the case uh, then they will endorse that. Let's say um, it is an election offense, and it it the office of the ombudsman deemed it that it's the Comelec who would be on uh, and with the best position to investigate it. Then they can endorse it, okay? But uh, there is a caveat. It does not mean that only Com Comelec has a jurisdiction on that because uh, under uh, Republic Act uh, uh, 9369. It, the COMELEC concurrent with other prosecuting arms has jurisdiction over election offenses. So the ombudsman can take co cognizance of the case, but if they deem it proper to endorse it before another office, then they can endorse it to, to another office. Okay. Let's say if there is a uh, labor issue involved, then they can endorse it to uh, to a different uh, agency. Okay. And, and so on. Okay. So now if did the the office would think that uh, a case build up would be necessary okay meaning a more uh, investigation on uh, pieces of evidence is necessary then the office can take cognizance and conduct a fact finding investigation okay uh, for example, if a, if a complaint is filed, let's say ill-gotten wealth or unexplained wealth, and they deemed it proper to conduct fact-finding in investigation, so pieces of evidence should discreetly be uh, taken and uh, the fact-finding or case buildup should uh, proceed in order for a proper uh preliminary case the complaint is sufficient okay uh and there is a uh, what is known as palpable merit on the uh in, in the complaint then uh, the complaint may be subjected to preliminary investigation already so even not uh, going to fact finding investigation 
Okay. So, as I've said, okay, so for those within the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan and RTC, okay, so it will be conducted uh, uh, to uh, Rule 112, Section 3, okay, but subject to the following uh, rules under Administrative Order Number 7. Okay. So if the complaint is not under oath or based only on official report, then the investigating officer shall require the complainant and the support the witnesses to uh, execute affidavit to substantiate. It must be under oath. Uh, you'll say, uh, sir, I thought you said that that uh, you will act on an anonymous complaint. Yes. So here we are speaking of a complaint with a the the, the person identifying himself, but it just so happened that the complaint is not under oath. So if the uh, investigating officer finds it that uh, there is merit to the case, he would call on the complainant and ask them to be ask them to be placed under oath, including the witnesses that he may produce. Okay. The second, now, if the the uh, investigating prosecutor has already secured the uh, uh, affidavit, then he can issue uh, an, an order directing the respondent to file his counter affidavit and controverting evidence. Okay, so um, just like in the ordinary flow of uh, uh, exchange of uh, pleadings or uh, affidavit in uh, preliminary investigations under the rules of court, under the rules of procedure in the office of the ombudsman, after receiving a copy of the, the counter affidavit, the complainant may file a rep reply affidavit after 10 days. Okay, But unlike in uh, ordinary preliminary investigation, it stops here with reply affidavit because uh, uh, filing a rejoinder and sure rejoinder uh, is uh, just uh, an option but you have to request for it and that it's not uh, under the rules okay so so that the exchange of pleading uh, would be uh, the faster okay and not wait for a rejoinder affidavit and a sure rejoinder affidavit so after the, the re reply affidavit then the case may be already um, submitted for uh, resolution okay uh, anyway as i've said earlier okay if a complaint is filed the respondent will be asked to comment there thereon. Okay. But uh after filing the comment, then the uh investigating prosecutor can ask the respondent to file a counter affidavit. But if he did not file a counter affidavit, the comment that he has already filed, okay, will be considered as their answer to the complaint. Okay, and that will be treated as his uh counter affidavit. Uh, for for uh, the, the the case file against him, okay. So during the preliminary investigation, there is no motion to dismiss that will be entertained, except if it, the ground is for lack of jurisdiction, okay. In the same manner, no motion for bill of particular may be entertained, okay. So if in case uh, there are some allegations in the complaint that is. Uh, unclear to the respondent he may request for a uh, clarificatory uh, questioning or hearing so that uh, any uh, uh, any uh, doubts on uh, the complaints or any questions on the, the the complaint against him may be uh, may be cleared out okay so next if the respondents cannot be served by the order okay and uh if the respondent was uh, okay yeah as uh, in in the alternative if he has been served but did not comply with the order to file a comment or a counter affidavit then the complaint shall be deemed submitted for resolution uh, based on the evidence of record for the simple reason that uh that in order not to to uh, cause any delay in the resolution of the complaint Okay, you see, if if the respondent is no longer working in in that particular office, or if the respondent uh, is is not uh, is no longer residing is in his uh, last known address, then the case will not be dismissed, but it will be deemed 
submitted as long as uh, the the, uh, the uh, order uh, has been served or there is an attempt for the order to be served but it turned out that uh, the respondents either did not uh, want to receive it or is no longer residing there at okay or it was uh, substituted uh, service so the case will be deemed uh, submitted for resolution okay so that uh, the uh, the the uh, respondent will not make it as an excuse not to receive the copy of the order and not file any comment or uh, counter affidavit thinking that the case will not be resolved or that or that the office of the ombudsman would be waiting for him to act on the order for him to file comment or counter affidavit okay so next one as i've said earlier okay after the filing of uh, the uh, respective uh, affidavits uh, the e investigating uh, prosecutor may conduct clarificatory hearing okay if there is uh, there are some questions or there are uh, matters that needs to be cleared up then he can schedule a clarificatory hearing the parties have the right to uh, be present thereat but they don't have the right to examine or cross examine the witness being questioned so it is the investigating prosecutor or lawyer of the ombudsman who will do the questioning the clarificatory questions now if the parties would want to have uh, questions asked for the the witness then sh they should course it through the investigating prosecutor okay they will not be allowed to ask questions on their own so they have to course it through the the investigating prosecutor okay why because this is not adversary in nature okay non litigus in nature so th they don't have the right to examine and cross examine the witness during a uh, preliminary investigation but they have the right to ask clarificatory questions okay just to clarify matters on records that are uh, absurd or unclear to them okay so uh if the 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 preliminary investigation has been terminated then the records of the case will be forwarded uh with his resolution to uh the uh, proper authorities for appropriate actions and as a rule if the case is cognizable by the Sandigan Bayan, eh, it is the uh, office of uh, it is the ombudsman who will be uh, approving such a uh, filing of an information uh, for other cases or lower lower ranking uh, public officials. The deputy ombudsman can uh, be the one to approve the the filing of information. So, but for Sandigan Bayan cases, it has to be the ombudsman himself who will approve for the uh, filing of the information okay so this is different from uh, uh, the national Prose prosecution services okay that uh, the filing of information need not go uh, to the uh, uh, secretary of justice for his approval so it goes up to the reviewing prosecutor and the city prosecutor or the provincial prosecutor will uh, approve the filing of the uh, information as the case may be okay but in the office of the ombudsman if it is cognizable by the sandigan by it is the ombudsman uh, who will approve the uh, filing uh, of uh, the complaint or even the dismissal of the complaint okay so can you file a motion for reconsideration if the resolution of the investigating lawyer or prosecutor of the office of the ombudsman is not uh, favorable to you okay uh, you do not agree with the resolution can you file a motion for the reconsideration the answer is yes the office allows only one motion for reconsideration to be filed and it should be filed within five days from the receipt of the notice from the office of the ombudsman hey okay. but if the information has already been filed in court you may still file a motion for reconsideration before the office of the ombudsman but you will have to file a motion for leave before the court who has already uh, acquired jurisdiction uh, over the information that was filed okay so you get the difference if the case is still with 
within the office of the ombudsman, uh, the information has not been filed, then you file a motion for reconsideration before the office of the ombudsman. Now, if the information is already filed in court, then you ask for a leave of court be before the the court handling that case that you will file a motion for reconsideration before the office of the ombudsman. Okay. Now, even if you file a motion for reconsideration, shall it be considered a bar to the filing of the information in court? The answer is no. So even if you file a motion for reconsideration, nothing will stop the office of the ombudsman from filing the informa information in court. Okay. So pending motion for reconsideration will not be a ground to stop the information from proceeding in court. Okay. Now, that's the criminal aspect of uh, the, uh, the rules of procedure in the Office of the Ombudsman. Now, let's go to the administrative investigation or administrative procedure where, when it comes to filing cases before the Office of the Ombudsman. As I've said earlier, one act, can you can commit three, or sometimes you can just commit one if it is just an administrative case. Okay. Like if you're always absent, that's not a crime, but an administrative case can be filed against you. Okay, uh, you took uh, a a, uh, a leave uh, or uh, absence without leave, then that can be an administrative case against you, but you did not commit any crime, uh, etc. Okay, so what are the grounds for administrative complaint? Okay, so meaning. You're not really committing a felony or a crime, but uh, you have committed something contrary to law or regulation, okay? Or your act is unreasonable, unfair, oppressive, or discriminatory. Your act is inconsistent with the general course of the agency's function, though in accordance with law, okay? Another, uh, it is based on mistake of law or an arbitrary assertment of facts, okay? Uh, in the exercise of discretionary powers, but for an improper purpose, uh, otherwise irregular, immoral, devoid of justification, due to any delay, refusal to comply with the referral or directive of the ombudsman or any of his depu deputies, and such other grounds as may be provided by the administrative code or other applicable law. Okay, so any act that is detrimental to public service. Uh, then uh, an administrative case may be filed against that uh, public official or employee. Okay. Now, how can administrative case be initiated before the office of the ombudsman? Now, it may be filed uh, as a written complaint. Okay. Not necessarily uh, affidavit, but uh, the office of the ombudsman, I've said, will act on uh, a, a written complaint. But... Uh, it's much better if it is uh, under oath accompanied by the affidavits of witnesses and if there are pieces of evidence that will support the charge that would be even better okay now is uh, the certificate of uh, forum shopping uh, required in administrative cases the answer is yes okay in the office of the ombudsman if you file a case for uh, uh, an uh, administrative offense uh, there has to be an accompanying certificate of forum shopping duly subscribed and sworn to by the complainant or his counsel. Okay. Um, may the office of the ombudsman or the respective, uh, respective deputy ombudsman on his initiative or on the basis of a complaint originally filed as a criminal action or a grievance complaint or request for assistance. Remember one of the functions, public uh, assistance or request for assistance, order the conduct of administrative proceedings. So uh, the question here is on its own, can the Office of the Ombudsman uh, file an administrative case? Or if there is a criminal case filed, can an administrative file, uh, case be filed even if there is no mention in the, in the, the criminal complaint? or if there is a grievance complaint or even a request for assistance, they can can it be right? Can it ripen into an administrative case? The answer is yes. The ombudsman or or his deputy may, uh, on his own initiative or on the basis of a complaint, uh, uh, originally filed as a criminal action or grievance complaint or request for assistance, they can conduct uh, administrative proceeding against an erring 
public official or employee. Now, how is administrative complaint acted upon? Okay, so this is uh, quite similar to a preliminary investigation before the office, but uh, slightly lighter. Okay, so the just like a criminal complaint, it will be evaluated first. And if there is no merit as to that uh, complaint, just like in criminal uh, or uh, cases or in preliminary investigation, it may be dismissed outright. Okay. Now, if it is a uh, grievance or request, it may be referred to uh, the Public Assistance Bureau for appropriate action. Now, uh, it may also be referred to uh, disciplinary authorities if uh, the ombudsman deemed it proper. Like it, it may be referred to uh, the Civil Service Commission. It may be referred to... to uh, other agencies, if they are the ones who can discipline the the public or the airing uh, official, okay, uh, it can be referred to other uh, agencies or office to conduct fact finding. As I've said, for uh, the case build up. Now, if it is docketed as an administrative case in the office of the ombudsman, then the office of the ombudsman may now uh, take cognizance of the case and proceed with the administrative. Uh, the case or uh, or administrative proceeding, okay. So as we said, it may be dismissed if the um um be, be the office of the ombudsman believe that the complainant has an adequate remedy in uh, another judicial or quasi judicial body, okay. Or if the complaint pertains to matters outside the jurisdiction of the ombudsman, if the complaint is trivial frivolous, vexatious, and made in bad faith, uh, or the complainant has no sufficient personal interest in the subject matter of the grievance, or the complaint was filed after one year from the occurrence of the act or omission complained of. So ito yung mga, these are the grounds wherein uh, the, uh, uh, the complaint may be dismissed by the office of the ombudsman. Okay. Now, uh, at its... Uh, at its option, I, the uh, Office of the Ombudsman can also refer this complaint to uh, other disciplinary uh, office who has jurisdiction over the airing officials. Okay. Now, how is the uh, uh, administrative uh, adjudication conducted in the Office of the Ombudsman? Okay. Just like in preliminary investigation, if it is docketed as an administrative case in the Office of the Ombudsman, an order will be issued asking the respondent to file his counter affidavit or other ev evidence, and the complainant will likewise be given uh, the same number of days, 10 days, in order to file his uh, reply affidavit okay, to the counter affidavit. And that's it. No more uh, uh, rejoinder, no more so rejoinder affidavit. Okay. Now, if the uh, hearing officer uh, deemed it proper that... Uh, there is a need to conduct cl uh, clarificatory hearings, then he will ask for a uh, schedule for a clarificatory hearing. Now, in that clarificatory hearing, uh, both parties have the opportunity to be present thereat, but without the right to examine or cross-examine the, the witness. As I've said earlier, it does not mean that you cannot ask any question, but you have to uh, you course uh, your question through the hearing officer. Okay, so it will not be adversarial in, in nature. Okay? So, if the um, hearing officials deemed it that there's no further proceedings uh, necessary, he will ask for the parties to file the respective position papers. And uh, if based on the position paper, uh, the, the, the uh, officer may also ask again for a clarificatory hearing uh, based on what is uh, uh, submitted in the position papers, affidavits, or pleadings. Okay, In that clarificatory hearing, okay, again, uh, you have the right to be present, but you cannot examine or cross-examine the witness, but you can ask questions through the hearing officer, not you directly. So if the hearing officer deemed it proper that uh, there is no further proceedings uh, necessary anymore. Then he will issue an order 
declaring that the case is now submitted for resolution. Okay? So, however, after the conduct of uh, preliminary uh, ay, clarificatory hearing, okay, and the uh, hearing officer deems it that there is a need for a formal investigation, then he will ask the party to file their respective uh, pre-trial briefs. Okay, they're not allowed to introduce any new matters in the pre-trial briefs. Okay, so let's just go back. So for for clarification purposes. So if during the clarification hearing, no further proceedings necessary, the case will be submitted for resolution. Now, if after clarificatory hearing there is a need for a formal investigation, then the the hearing officer will ask the parties to file their respective pre-trial briefs. Okay, so you see the difference. If there is no need to conduct formal investigation, the case is submitted for hearing. Now, if there is a need to conduct formal investigation, then the parties will be asked to file their pre-trial briefs. Okay, so it will proceed for a it to conduct a formal proceeding, which is non-litigious in nature. Okay, and with proper regard to the right of the party to parties to due process. Okay, so in the formal investigation, okay, it will uh, conduct uh, a continuous trials. The parties will be uh, allowed to appear, allowed to present their evidence. Okay, uh, they uh, will be allowed to cross examine. During, this is for, during formal. Okay, uh, formal investigation already, but if the the party has been absent then he shall uh, lose his right to cross examine but uh, under the rules you are afforded to be given an opportunity to uh, to cross examine the uh, witnesses presented okay in a formal uh, investigation so only witnesses with affidavit will be um, uh, allowed uh, during the formal investigation, okay, and uh, allowed to testify during the formal investigation, uh, unless the testimony of the witness involves newly discovered evidence, then uh, that witness without an affidavit prior to the uh, formal investigation stage will not be allowed by the hearing officer. Okay, so it has to be for a good cause that uh, the newly discovered evidence will be admitted. Okay. Uh, by uh, the uh, hearing officer. Okay, so during the formal investigation stage, the party shall be allowed assistance of counsel, and they can ask for the production of document and request the office for uh, subpoena, ad testifica testificandum, and subpoena uh, uh, ducis tecum. Okay, and then after that, the uh, case shall be submitted for de for decision. Are there any prohibited pleadings during uh, administrative, uh, administrative hearings in the office of the Ombudsman? The answer is yes. Motion to dismiss is not allowed okay, on any ground uh, except uh, if your ground would be uh, it, for lack of jurisdiction of the office of the Ombudsman. Bill of particulars will not be allowed because uh, you can ask for a clarificatory hearing wherein you can ask the hearing officer to ask the questions to the uh the witness uh 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 involved <clears throat> and no dilatory motions will be entertained okay so extension of time postponement second motion for reconsideration re reinvestigation so this will not be allowed in administrative cases cases okay now Within 30 days or not later than 30 days after the case has been uh, declared for resolution, the the case the hearing officer should submit the proposed uh, decision for the uh, re approval of the ombudsman. Okay, so that would be uh, after, uh, after within not later than 30 days after the case has been submitted for this the decision. Okay, is a motion for reconsideration or reinvestigation allowed? In administrative cases, the answer is still yes. Just like in criminal case cases, a uh, motion for reconsideration or reinvestigation may be allowed, but only once. Okay. Uh, then uh, the grounds for a motion for reconsideration and or reinvestigation in an administrative case. Okay. 
uh, Administrative Order Number no. Seven gave two grounds: the newly uh, discovered evidence, okay, which will mat not, not just newly discovered evidence, but it should be material enough to affect the decision or uh, the uh, order of the Office of the Ombudsman. Now, the second ground is that if there is error, a grave error of facts or laws or serious irregularities com uh, uh, committed that will be prejudicial to the movement, the, the, the one filing the motion for reconsideration or reinvestigation. Okay, so this is also allowed in administrative cases. So in administrative cases, when does the, the uh, decision of the, the Office of the Ombudsman become final and executory? Now, obviously, if the respondent is absolved, that is final and executory. In case of uh, a, a conviction or a, a, a affirmation of the uh, the uh, offenses charged against him administratively, if the penalty is public censure, reprimand, suspension of not more than one month, or a fine equivalent to one month sal salary, the decision of the ombudsman is final, executory, is and unappealable. In other cases, okay. The uh, uh, decision may be uh, appealed under Rule 43 of the Rules of Court before the Court of Appeals. Okay, so I've, I've been telling you to read the uh, Administrative Order Number no. Seven as amended because you may see uh, a uh, some uh, like uh, uh, in uh, Republic Act Seven Six Seven Seven Zero, uh, it would meant old copies would mention. Rule 45 and not 43. Okay, so be careful with that. <clears throat> so in admin cases, where will you appeal it? Before the Court of Appeals under Rule 43. Okay, um, as I've said earlier, when the decision, uh, uh, when uh, the penalty is public censure, reprimand, suspension of not more than one month, or a fine equivalent of one, one month salary, the decision is final and unappealable. Okay, so this is my caveat, okay? As early as the case of Fabian versus Disierto, okay? The Supreme Court has already invalidated Section 27 of Republic Act 6770 or the Ombudsman Act and Section 7 of Administrative Order Number no. 7, the one that we are studying before it was amended because it was provided there that the decision of the Ombudsman may be appealable by certiorari under Rule 45. Okay, so the Supreme Court said uh, the 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 law cannot do that, Congress cannot do that, and the ombudsman in in the issuance of an administrative order cannot do that, uh, increasing the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court without its advice and concurrence because this is in violation of the 1987 Constitution. Okay, and it also states that it is in 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 consistent with. The very rule itself, Rule 45, which states that judgment or final orders of the Court of Appeals, the Sandigan Bayan, the Court of Tax Appeals, the Regional Trial Courts, and other courts authorized by law. So the Supreme Court said that provision under 6770 and Section 7 of Rule 3 of uh, Administrative Order Number no. 7 is considered unconstitutional. Now, in relation there too, in the case of Carpio Morales versus Court of Appeals, uh, uh, in connection with the case of Jun Mayor Jun Jun Binay, uh, also Section 14 of Republic 6770 or the Ombudsman Act has been uh, declared as unconstitutional because it is similar to the fourth paragraph of Section 27 of Republic Act 6770, which was already declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the case of Fabian versus Disierto. Okay, so we are clear on that. Huh? So be careful when you're reading codal provisions. Make sure that it's updated because you might get in trouble. Okay, is everything clear uh, at this point? Just uh, put thumbs up or type uh, VCL in the comment box so that uh, we will know that everything is clear. Okay, so you will have no problem. Now, May the Office of the Ombudsman preemptively suspend a, an erring public official or employee? The answer is yes, if the evidence of guilt is strong and any of the following would concur. That it, the case or the charge involves dishonesty, oppression, or grave misconduct, or neglect in the performance of duty, 
or the charges would warrant removal from service. Okay. And lastly, if the respondent's continued stay in the office may prejudice the case. Okay. It may tamper on the evidence or uh, influence witnesses. So the, um, the office of the ombudsman may issue a uh, preventive suspension order. Okay. So number one, the evidence of guilt is strong and any of the three would concur. Okay. This would be without pay, but the suspension should not be more than six months. And prior notice and hearing is not required because this is not a penalty. It is a uh, preventive measure uh, uh, on the part of the state. Okay, so hindi siya required no notice on hearing because uh, it is not yet a penalty. Okay, so <clears throat> what would be the effect if the penalty of suspension or removal, okay, of the uh, or removal and the uh, the respondent wins the appeal. You, that's why we're saying that uh, the, it's not yet a a a, a, a penalty. So the, if the penalty for suspension or removal uh, of the respondent and the respondent wins the appeal, he will be considered as having been under preventive suspension and shall be paid the salary and such other uh, emoluments that he did not receive by reason of the suspension or removal. Okay, so you, you you get it. So if the, the penalty is suspension or removal and the respondent appealed the case and the resolution of the appeal states that uh, uh, he did not commit anything uh, wrong, then that will be treated as a preventive suspension, thereby uh, allowing him to recover uh, unpaid salary and other benefits that he may have miss missed during the uh the uh, the period uh, of uh, the appeal well for the uh, where in the penalty of suspension or removal uh, was uh, uh, given by the office of the ombudsman okay so I hope that uh, everything is clear okay as I've said if you have uh, questions uh, you can uh, send a message to my uh, Facebook account via Messenger, it's Ryan Parsabayan. You can also ask message, uh, ask questions to uh, through uh, the the Villas's Law Center uh, uh, Facebook account and YouTube account. You can also visit their uh, website. It is www.villasislawcenter.com. Uh, okay. Uh, with the innovations of uh, the Villasis Law Center, you can uh, prepare for the 2023 bar exam anywhere, anytime with your uh, electronic gadgets. You can study anywhere. You have no reason not to prepare and be ready for the 2023 bar exam. Okay, so I hope everything is clear. I wish you all good luck. Uh, so with Villasis Law Center, together we can. God bless. Godspeed, everyone. Walang natira video video. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance din. So, kano lang kas kadali yung object niyo, no? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natin ang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natin ang medium period, pag may natin ang mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinipidang natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So there are four exceptions. No? Number one. So, of course, my friends, 
you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstances, you object mo muna. Pag may natinang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natinang medium period, pag may natinang mitigating circumstances, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung consider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstances, isa lang yung efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstances. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one, So, of course, my friends, 
you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already. So maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely. There is no question he, because he would accept. Okay? Uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third... Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira din yung video. Pag may natirang mitigating chart of cash in, so ganun lang kas kandali yung object mo. No? So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating chart of cash, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natirang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinisider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstance. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one, So, 
Of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already. So maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt, and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely. There is no question he, because he would accept. Okay? Uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third... Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira video video. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance din. So kano lang kas kadali yung object niyo, no? So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natin ang mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinisider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No?
So, of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are being controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are being controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt, and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira ni Jude. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstances, so kano lang kas kadali yung object niya. No? So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstances, mag-i-object mo muna. Pag may natin ang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natin ang medium period, pag may natin ang mitigating circumstances, minimum period. So gano'n lang kasimple. So okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinisider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstances, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na ito. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one,
So, of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are being controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are being controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt, and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely. There is no question he, because he would accept. Okay? Uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third... Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira video video. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance din. So kano lang kas kadali yung object niyo, no? So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natin ang mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung consider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No?
So, of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are being controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are being controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt, and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira dito dito. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance dito. So, ganun lang kas kadali yung object dito. No? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung consider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstance. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one.
So, of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already. If you talk In relation to days in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Together we can.